Get Back Into Books with Richard and Judy. If you enjoyed the best exotic Marigold Hotel, you will definitely want to read Debbie Mogak's latest novel, Heartbreak Hotel. It was too early to fortify himself in the promising-looking King's Head pub. Tonight, Jethro and the Dreamers. He pictured jovial hayseeds strumming banjos. We're off to a rundown B&B in Wales in this episode where we could pick up a few useful skills. This is very clever because not only do you run these residential courses for car maintenance or basic cookery or gardening for beginners, but the people who come on the course, because they've just broken up, mm -hmm. they're on the rebound, so it's a sort of dating agency. Mm -hmm. So much more than your average book club. This is the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Well, first and foremost, I've just got to say, I love Buffy, her central <laughs> character. I mean, because he's a buffer. He's this um, this ageing actor. He's an actor. An actor. An well, old yes, well corrected. Um, whose, whose highlight was appearing, and some of the listeners may remember this, Crown Court. Yes, which, on Granada Television. That's right. It was a daytime courtroom drama uh, yep. through the 70s. Uh, but it was good money and, and good work for thespes like Buffy, because if you've got a regular position, and I think he was the clerk of the court, wasn't he, um, according mm -hmm. to the book anyway, uh, he was in virtually every episode. And, you know, that was money. That was money to Buffy. But anyway, we find him now on his uppers, in his 70s, and wondering what the heck to do with what's left of his life. And he inherits this, this bed and breakfast in rainy, rainy Wales, just over the border from Shropshire. Buffy take, he takes us by the hand through this story and introduces us to these wonderful characters, the people who live in the Welsh village where the bed and breakfast is, his guests, all of whose backstories Deborah tells beautifully there. And it's very, very funny. Um, in fact, I thought quite a lot of the book reminded me of Tom Sharp. Mm. In, in some of the witticisms and, mm. and, and mm. some of the exchanges and the dialogues. It's a very mm. funny book, but it's also incredibly touching um, and very romantic. Mm. I love the way she writes about older people. Mm. Um, as she said to us in the interview, that uh, people, sort of the baby boomers, if you like, the, the 60s generation are, are kind of people who feel they're reinventing old age. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we're not, we're, you know, people are not happy anymore to think of themselves going into a care home and yep. kind of fading away. Yep. The, the, that 60s generation, they want to carry on living. They want to kind of be right on the ball still. And, and this, this captures that very much. Yes, and, and, and bearded, portly, wine-slugging Buffy oh. absolutely, no, he absolutely epitomises that last chance saloon yeah. that, that, that the 60 and 70-somethings still inhabit. Yeah, it's great. Hi, I'm Deborah Mogach, and I'm the author of Heartbreak Hotel. It was Saturday morning and people were out and about. How blameless they looked in the sunshine. They greeted each other across the street. A pimply youth, a smiling pimply youth, carried an old lady's shopping to her car. Buffy spotted a greengrocer's, a butcher's and, good God, a gent's outfitter's. He had no idea such places still existed. A boy actually leaned his bicycle against the wall. Instead of leaving it, wheels spinning sprawled in a doorway to trip people up. No attack dogs either, with their bowed legs and bulging scrotums. Here, a border collie courteously sniffed Fig, welcoming him to his town and its smells, and trotted on. And the postman was whistling. Buffy thought, maybe people have been living like this all the time and I didn't know. He stopped at the baker's. Fig lapped from a bowl of water, thoughtfully left at the door. The window was stuck with the notices for the Green Man Festival and amateur dramatics. Could this be the community Buffy had been yearning for all these years? A place where he would have a place? Both my parents were writers. My father wrote 120 books, he worked out, and my mother about 40. She illustrated and wrote children's books, and my father just wrote anything, naval biographies, children's books. So it was sort of what parents did. I presumed everybody wrote. I presumed everybody sat at what was then typewriters, obviously, um, tapping away all day with a manuscript pile thickening beside them. Well, I did rebel, obviously, because you don't want to do what your parents did. So I, I worked as a waitress and I trained as a teacher and I worked in, in a library. I did all sorts of other jobs. But in my mid-twenties, I suppose I sort of surrendered to it. <laughs> Would one of these middle-aged hippie women with their keep knocked and green shopping bags be the next love of his life? No, he was finished with all that. Besides, who would have him? He was a used car with too many previous owners, each with their own special complaints about his parts and performance. No, those days were over, but he was not on the scrap heap yet. Bridie had liked this town enough to move here. 
He wished he remembered more of what she'd told him in her letters. I, I went to live in Pakistan for two years with my then husband, the Mr. Mogak of my name, and we were working there, and I started writing for Pakistani newspapers, and I was sort of liberated because I wasn't in my home base at all, and I didn't have anybody looking over my shoulder, and I didn't have to feel I don't want to or do want to do what my parents do. You know, I forgot about that. And I just got going, and I wrote rather bad articles for Pakistani newspapers, like curry and chips, an English girl in Karachi. Um, but they all got published, so that gave me confidence, and I started my first novel out there, which was called You Must Be Sisters. And um, there was no stopping me after that. My parents were very supportive. They were really good, and they also taught me that when you write, you have to work hard and not say, oh, I don't feel like it today. They sort of kept office hours, and it was a, you know, a serious job of work, and I've got that Puritan work ethic. I'm a, I do work every day. I work every morning from half past nine to one. And I feel, as I said, a bit odd if I don't do that. Um, and then I obviously work later on in the day. Not in the afternoon. Can't do a stroke in the afternoon. His heart pounded. He wished he had someone with him for moral support. It was too early to fortify himself in the promising-looking King's Head pub. Tonight, Jethro and the Dreamers. He pictured jovial hayseeds strumming banjos. Already he saw his own trusty mug hanging from the beams. No gastro bollocks here, and no bankers either. The only Land Rover in sight was spattered with mud and appeared to have a sheep in the back seat. Well, when I finish a book, I mean, everyone thinks you feel terribly relieved, but I feel grief-stricken because I'm sort of saying goodbye to all these characters. And I've lived with them for so long, sometimes for two or three years, and I know them so well. And they've often surprised me by what they've done, and they've sometimes behaved very badly. But they're my characters, and they've taken on a life of their own and become real people in my head. So I'm very sad to see them go. And occasionally, I can't bear to see them go, and they come back in another book, like in Heartbreak Hotel. The hero, Buffy, who's this boozy old actor, age 70, I mean, he was in his own novel earlier called The Ex-Wives, and I just couldn't bear to let him go. He was like a guest at a party who simply wouldn't leave. Well, our book club wouldn't be the same without you, so keep telling us what you'd like to leave through. Um, I would recommend reading Between a Mother and Her Child by Elizabeth Noble. I love the way that she weaves relationships and everyday life and then brings out something quite extraordinary. I have just finished reading Bertie Plays the Blues by Alexander McCall Smith, which is from a series of books called 44 Scotland Street. They're set in Edinburgh and they feature several different families um, because he originally created them as a series of small novels for the Scotsman newspaper. They are absolutely brilliantly funny, um, amusing. His typical kind of gentle humour but real laugh-out-loud places as well. Highly recommended. Uh, the book I'm reading is Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Roderick Rules. The author is Jeff Kinney, and I like it because it's funny. I'm currently reading a book by Raymond D. Feast. Uh, it's called At the Gates of Darkness, and it's a science fiction fantasy. So it's got loads of uh, magicians and dragons and trolls and elves and all sorts in it. Enjoy it immensely. Tell us what titles you've enjoyed on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Find us on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club. Um, I was saying, obviously, as part of all the material that we do for the book club, Judy and I write quite extensive reviews of the books that we recommend. And, and the one that I've written for yours, I open it by saying, what is it about Deborah Margaret and hotels? She can't stop writing about them. And I go on to say, but that's a great thing, because... Hotels are such wonderful repositories of, of stories, aren't they, and storylines and, and plot lines. And, and, and this one's an absolute corker. I loved it from, from, from start to finish. But why, why are you returning so often to hotels as, a, as a, if you like, a motif or a, a well, canvas? I mean, I think they're a gift to a novelist because you've got a disparate group of people who've got nothing in common mm -hmm. in a confined space mm -hmm. for a limited amount of time, and you just see what happens and how they react. I also think that hotels are very unjudgmental that's what we pay for mm. and so you can be both more yourself or you can be somebody completely different yeah. yeah and they're sexy and interesting and all sorts of weird things happen in them so I just sort of got 
got a bit of a hotel bug, I suppose. <laughs> now, it's interesting what you said about how there is this, this chemistry. Um, you throw all these ingredients into the, into the pot and see what happens. And I, hearing you talk about it like that, it, it confirms a suspicion. You tell me if I'm wrong. I think that some of the storylines here and what happens between your uh, large cavalcade of characters, a lot of it happened on the page. You didn't actually plot line at all. A, a, a lot of the, the, the interactions and, and the storylines mm. occurred to you as you wrote, as you, as you put your characters together. Is that, am I completely wrong? Well, you're slightly wrong. You're just a bit wrong, Richard, <laughs> because I did plot it quite a bit. But, on the other well, hand... I can only apologise. Richard, you're a bit right because things took off. Yes. You know, you, yeah, yeah. I, I am quite a plotty person. That's mm. why I do lots of screenplays, because I'm, I'm right. fond of a good plot. OK. Yeah. Um, but... Things do take off, and certain characters start to... I'm sure many of your authors say this, and you yourselves as writers know this. Characters can take, take off and sort of thicken up and start breathing and moving yes. and actually pull the plot about in all sorts of ways and sometimes they... demolish it entirely and make up, up yes. a whole new plot. Do you find that they sometimes tap you on the shoulder and say, no, 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 I, I wouldn't do that. That's not me. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they talk to you. Yeah. And actually, right, although I have to know a character really well before I start and I live with them for weeks and weeks and I sort of am them. I walk around the supermarket being, you know, right. a 70-year-old boozy actor with a beard. <laughs> it's a funny, it's a funny old life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have to know them really well because if you don't know them very well, when you start writing, they can just do anything. Yeah. Um, and that is chaos, mm. basically. Yeah. So if you know them well, they'll help you with the plot. Yes. yes. But as you write, things start to reveal themselves about the person. You suddenly realise, ah, he's got very shiny shoes. He's a bit vain. Mm. He's got corns. Ah, oh, and he went to a shropodist and rather fancied the woman who took his corns off. <laughs> and then you think, ah, oh, well, that's why he got married to the wrong woman, because he's vain, hence his shiny shoes, because um, his shoes were a bit too small. So the characters create themselves as well as you go along. Yes. But I think at the beginning, you do have to know them pretty well to start, else anything can happen. So we have, we, this, there we have Buffy. I mean, that, Buffy. that's, but that's, we love uh, Buffy. That, that's how he starts, and, and that's the guy you're talking about, this sort of 70 year old ex actor who is a deeply lovable color, uh, character, even if uh, flawed. Um, tell us what happens to him, if you can, just at the beginning, which gets him into the Heartbreak Hotel. Well, Buffy has been around the block a few times times on the marital merry-go-round. I mean, his epithet is, I don't think I'll get married again. I'll just find a woman I don't like and give her a house. <laughs> um, so he's no slouch in the old marriage department. And um, he long ago had an affair... Well, he had an on-off affair with a theatrical landlady called Bridie during and between his marriages. And she left him in her will, a B&B &B in Wales. So he takes it over because, as he says, the picture's got small. He yeah. thinks that I mean, his acting career is not going yeah, that well. Yeah. Mm. He's a bit too fond of the old cab sav, really. Sits boozing away. Um, so when he takes he's over fed this, up with London. he's fed up with London. He's tired of London. He's tired of London, and um, wants to. And, he, and basically, he decides to because none of his children, stepchildren, can believe he could possibly leave London or go out zone outside zone two. As <laughs> one of his many ex-wives said, it's enough of a heave-ho to get yourself to the Chelsea Arts Club. <laughs> um, so 170 miles outside Soho, um, he goes to Wales and takes over this B&B. But because, as we may notice, much as we love Wales, it is no stranger to rain. Mm. Um, and instead, you know, after breakfast, you're supposed to leave a B&B, &B, aren't you? That's but yeah. after yeah. breakfast, it will be chucking down outside and all his guests will say, oh, we can't go off as dyke in this Ellie, can yeah. we? Um, so they all hang about and he's too polite to let them... And he, well, he doesn't mind either. He doesn't He, he actually he really enjoys the crack. He enjoys the crack because if there's anything he likes, it's an audience. And gradually yeah. a theme begins to develop here because more and more people... And, and you, you tell us their fascinating little backstories and then they come to the hotel and more and more of them are separating and, and divorcing and, and they have something in common apart from that, which is that... The, per the person that they've either left or who've left them have taken with them certain skills. Um, all marriages have that. I mean, I, I do the paperwork, don't I? Um, yes. And if you and I were to split yes. up, you'd have Where to learn how to do the paperwork. You know, you'd need... Right. You'd already, yes. et cetera. Um, and and <laughs> what do you do, Judy, that <laughs> I don't have to, to do? <laughs> <laughs> Drive the car. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, and <laughs> and this, a light goes on in his head one day, about halfway through the book. He thinks, I've got it. We can run courses in this hotel teaching people the skills that the departing partner has taken with them. And that way, we have more than weekend guests. We can run courses running a week. And that's actually, I have to say, that's a brilliant idea in its own right. It's 
absolutely brilliant. You see, I've had two good money-making ideas in my career. One was Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, outsourcing the elderly. Mm -hmm. Brilliant yes. money-making scheme, yep. saving money for the country, all that. This is very clever because not only do you run these residential courses for car maintenance or basic cookery or gardening for beginners, um, but the people who come on the course, because they've just broken up, mm -hmm. they're on the rebound, so it's mm -hmm. a sort of dating agency. Mm -hmm. exactly. But even more cunning is that this hotel, like the Best Exotic, is a bit down on, down on its luck. Yeah. So the people on the DIY course repair the hotel. <laughs> the people on the car maintenance course service his rotten old car. The people on the gardening course do the garden and clear that up. And they pay him for it. For it. Which what makes, a good makes idea. him sound cynical, and he's not. Buffy's he's not. lovely. He's he a great be, character. He should be one of these czars for the elderly that the... Um, <laughs> That, that the government so needs because you come up with all these incredibly original and productive and also very sociable and happy ideas for people to spend their, mm. their, their later lives. Mm. I'm, I'm fascinated by Buffy because I love actors um, and I suspect you do too. I mm. mean, I, you sus I, I suspect you love people who like to have an audience, people who are very exhibitionist, very larger than like life. Like a drink. Yeah. And like a drink, yeah. 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 And so, Okay, leaving that one. I mean, are you because you're on, you're on a roll with this kind of uh, theme of uh, theme of uh, elderly people now? Are you good? What do you know? What your next one's going to be? I don't know. I am on a bit of a roll. I mean, the other reason I like actors, they call you darling, mm. and they're totally insincere. Of course, it's because they can't don't know your name. I don't <laughs> care. I don't mind insincerity. It's fine with me. Um, I know. I must think of another one. I must think of another hotel. I can't do another hotel, really. You think but, not? Well, no. oh, go on. I feel that like I'm repeating myself. The awful thing about writing, I mean, I've written 17 novels and I keep getting terrified that I'm going to find I've written the same sentence that I wrote in, you know, 1982. Yeah. Yeah. Probably have, but luckily, yeah. luckily I don't read the old books. Oh. Um, no, I'm going to think of something else. I'm quite, I'm interested in the way that we're living differently. My generation, because we're 60s kids and we're sort of, we think, this may be big-headed of us, we think we're sort of reinventing age as we get older. Right. Because women that I know, and men, of my age, 64, 65, we're not behaving like we used to behave, no, you know. Not. I mean, the reason I wrote this book partly is that three years ago I fell in love with somebody who lives in this little town in Wales, and we're going to get married in two weeks, you know. Oh. 65 years old, getting married, how weird is that? But that's what we are doing, and yeah. people are going to, across Rajasthan on old motorbikes and trekking elephant trekking in Nepal and oh, that'll be the next one then yeah <laughs> well there was a there was a survey only I think last month uh, that said that for, that those who are 65 and over do not consider themselves elderly no absolutely mm. not I mean I think very grown up indeed is a word that I'd use except of yeah. course we're not even that because we're just fools <laughs> just as foolish as we always were well if there's one word that can sum up this book it's on the front cover and it's uh, and it comes from the Times reviewer and it simply says bliss and uh, I, I'd endorse that. I, I enjoyed this book so much. It gave me so much pleasure. I loved every single character. I, I, I loved the twists and turns of the story, and I just love Buffy, and I, and I want to meet him. I, just, I just wish you could somehow you make him real. You probably have in every act of yes, the Yes, I, I can think of a couple. I'm actually. turning it into a TV series, so... Oh, oh, really I, I was going to ask if it was either going to the big screen or the small, and I think oh. it suits television. So it, do I. It, yeah, yeah, it's a series, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Yes, yeah, series. Oh, um, fantastic. Do you know which channel? BBC. Excellent. And so there'll be a Sunday course nights, a week. I, I hope so. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. it's a Sunday night mm. yeah, special, yeah. I think. Because it's ten got past some it. good jokes, and we, we want a few jokes on yeah. Sunday Oh, it's laugh out loud on it, yeah. on yeah. many pages. Well, congratulations, anyway, Deborah. It's lovely. Heartbreak Hotel. Couldn't put it down. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I always thought of myself back in the day as a bit of a heartbreaker. Yeah, many a time you've made me want to weep, Richard. Must be my eldest good looks. No, they left the building long ago. Well, I mean, really, Judy. Thank you very much. Right. That was more like Tommy Cooper than Elvis Presley. <laughs> Where's your fez? <laughs> right, that's it. Never coming back. Hang on, we're not even halfway through. Never Coming Back is the latest in the David Raker series, and Tim Weaver will be here to tell us more. He's an author and a working journalist. Now, who'd have thought that combination could be a winner, eh? That must be, because it takes one to know one. I just don't know where else to go. She's my sister. You said the whole family disappeared. Yes. When? 7th of January. Never coming back. No, not me. That's our next title on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Exclusive to WH Smith.